A lot of, uh, as much as I'm sad that your uh, tenor is coming to an end and that you're leaving us, I'm so happy that you're joining this podcast. Thank you so much for being with me. Uh, Ralph, you are German, European, Lebanese, citizen of the world. How do you define your identity? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, identity is always something you construct more or less and you feel attached to certain things. Um, yes, as you said, I feel myself very much as a citizen of the world. I like to see myself like that. I'm a diplomat. I'm a professional nomad. I stay a couple of years in the place and then I move on. But still, I feel that I have strong roots. Um, and um, definitely my, my, my existence is very much rooted in Germany, in its culture, in its uh, history. Um, I served the longest time of my life as a German diplomat. I visited university there, my brain was formed in Germany. But of course, I spent also early childhood uh, years in Lebanon and I have um, a very deep connection to this country as well. You've got deep connections, you've got deep memories. You grew up in Lebanon at the most beautiful era. What do you remember mostly of Lebanon at that time? Well, I have the typical childhood memories. Um, it feels very warm and very uh, nourishing. Uh, I remember the uh, dinner, the, the, the Sunday lunches at Teta's, I remember the scents of the mountains, I remember the food um, being uh, nurtured, being carried by my parents. I remember my school very well. I went to Notre Dame, Dame de Jamour, spent a couple of years there. Um, and uh, What about the people? Well, the people, um, uh, always I had the impression that the people were very caring and uh, very warm and uh, very generous. And this is what I found uh, when I came back to Lebanon as well. Raf Taraf, I've been in this industry for the past 30 years, three decades, and I've interviewed the whole world. And I have come at an era where Lebanon was witnessing a certain rebirth. And then I witnessed uh, the decline of everything we dreamt of, because actually the foundations were not solid. Uh, you are among the few diplomats I've encountered and who have touched me personally a lot, because I felt your sincerity towards uh, uh, our Lebanese problems, and you have met Lebanese from different backgrounds, and you did not open uh, uh, the embassy to a certain microcosm of people. It was open to people who came from different uh, backgrounds, different walks of life, and I love that, very simply, uh, in the depth of those problems. Uh, Lebanon's economic and financial crisis ranks among uh, the worst economic um, crisis in the world. What is the future of our economy, according to you? See, I believe in order to be able to make a step forward, and I think that there is an agreement today that Lebanon needs a step forward, <clears throat> um, one needs to have at least a rough understanding of what has happened and why we are here. Um, and um, you will hear a lot of very uh, knowledgeable economists who describe you in detail with a lot of numbers and figures uh, what has happened to this country, and then there are all these kind of, of aggressive words to describe the situation. Um, if you make it very simple, um, uh, after the civil war, and that is my reading, I'm not pretending that it's correct, uh, but I think that this is how I understand the situation today. After the, um, the civil war, um, there was an agreement between the political leaders to turn a page um, and to uh, look forward and to try to rebuild Lebanon. And that um, rebuilding Lebanon was done on a, on a rather shaky basis. It worked for a couple of years. Um, there were decisions made, um, but the basic principle was that the state was overspending, um, the public debt was exploding, um, and um, this helped pacify the situation after the civil war. Um, it was obvious that this model of overspending and the state delivering uh, on or, or spending assets it did not have because it was not matched by any functioning economy. Uh, the only sector which was functioning um, and in a very dysfunctional way was the da banking sector. Um, this lasted for 20, 25 years, a generation, um, and this came to an end. So basically Lebanon has to uh, reinvent itself in a very fundamental way, and, but in a very simple way. Um, the question needs to be answered, 
how is Lebanon going to actually produce anything of relevance that it can attract um, investment, that it can um, uh, be part of uh, the productive side of, of things. So what's going to be the new model of economy for Lebanon to survive? You know, when I ask uh, Lebanese decision makers about their vision of um, what that could be, um, I receive uh, basically um, uh, the answers uh, around tourism and agriculture. I don't think that Lebanon can live off tourism and agriculture. That might be, um, or, you know, the partying place for, uh, it used to be Gulf Arabs, today it's the diaspora which comes back. This provides economic opportunities for a happy few. And you see that, you know, things are picking up again. Um, but it doesn't really feed the population. It's not enough. Um, so you need to work to make the, the cake bigger. Lebanon has a lot of assets um, which it can tap into. Um, a fabulous, uh, still a fabulous e uh, education system. You have very qualified people. You educate people to export them to Gulf countries, to the US and to other markets. Um, it would be important to create opportunities here um, in Lebanon, but this requires some work on the fundamentals. You need to have a proper system, you have to have some rule of law, you need to have some uh, order. The, the state needs to be able to, um, uh, to provide basic services, um, and, um, and, and for that you need to have something which all Lebanese actually push back on. You have to have a proper taxing system. You need to give the state some revenues. Um, and the only revenues the state has so far are, are customs. But this is not enough for a state to build up a proper infrastructure. Mm. The European Union is going to help Lebanon. And how can you help Lebanon? See, um, we have, um, I have uh, here in the last four years uh, devoted a lot of my time and energy to try to um, uh, convince uh, Lebanese decision makers together with my fellow uh, diplomats to grasp the chance of which is given by the um, by the IMF to actually um, reconstruct uh, the economic system without this it is impossible to actually get Lebanon out of its current situation where you can start rebuilding uh, a system where the state has the role of the regulator. You, uh, you will definitely not build in Lebanon um, um, European-style welfare state. It will resemble more the American kind of free enterprise, uh, open uh, state, where the state has a much more limited role, but still there are certain functions which need to be um, addressed properly. For this, we have provided expertise, we have provided assistance, we have provided models, um, we have um, uh, tried to, to encourage um, a debate around these issues. Um, and unfortunately, I can see that uh, this debate, as much as I believe it is, it is um, central for Lebanon, um, uh, is always faced with what I call the distractions. You know, there are always things which are more important. Um, electing a parliament, electing a president, um, delineating the maritime borders, um, the issue of the refugees. Now, I'm not saying that these issues are not important. They can be of existential importance, like the story with the maritime borders. This was at the time an issue of um, war or peace. It gives me hope as a citizen that, you know, someday, Things will get better. Let's see. And I'll have, you know, the oil. And then this is, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, a normal citizen, how he thinks and how he perceives things. See, the, the oil in itself will not bring any blessing. I can tell you a number of countries and who are And the IMF as well will not bring, you know, the, the, will not be the only blessing. The IMF will allow you to reorganize your system in a way which is more transparent, more accountable, and which will help you. Um, generate um, some surplus which you can re-inject into the economy. This is what the IMF can do. Yeah, this is obvious, but uh, after of what you just stated before that, you organized a lot of conferences and talks and roundtables. No, 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 it, it was more great. behind the scenes yeah, work with great. the decision makers. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm taking the place of any normal citizen. Uh, for this citizen, everything is theory, as people need to see something. Yeah. Tangible. Yes. People want pragmatic and practical solutions. How can the EU support Lebanon today in addressing its crisis apart from organizing all those get togethers and policy making and, and papers? And yeah. See, 
this is very concrete. <laughs> Mind you, uh, this is very concrete. Um, and I can break it down. You know, you need to have a capital control law. It's as easy as that. Mm. You cannot run a system where each commercial bank decides in the morning how they're going to treat the deposits of depositors in the bank. This is very concrete. This is very, uh, very, very specific. Mm. And um, it's not about organizing conferences and seminars and papers. It is about putting the decision makers on the spot and telling them, how do you justify that you don't want a capital control law? How can you justify that you just go on like that, still dreaming of a surplus which will come in order to have your old model continue to exist? And the old model, remember, I described as overspending uh, resources you don't have. And a lot of political decision makers are very delusional because they believe they can go back there. There is no way back there because you will not receive the 30 billion US dollars estimated which were needed to get to, to have the old system being afloat. These things are very, very specific. They sound a bit, a bit broad, but they're very, when we talk about it, it's very specific. Can you pass a state budget, please? A state budget is actually just a, sh a balance sheet where you say what the, gov what the government earns and what the government spends, and both columns need to add up. Of course, this includes debt, but Lebanon, unfortunately, has worked itself into a situation where it can't even take up debt on international financial markets. So these are very specific things, and they are discussed. It's not that they're not discussed. You will read in the newspapers that um, the government is trying to put together a state budget for the year 2023. Um, they understand the importance of the issue. It is not an abstract thing. It is very specific. So... Um, uh, to go back to the refugees to, issue. To, to the refugees issue, um, I understand that this is um, an issue which is, first of all, perceived by many Lebanese as being an ex existential threat. Second, I'm, I also understand that it is very divisive. And um, from my perspective, I can tell you um, a lot of discussions I encounter here in Lebanon are very familiar to me when I compare them to the discussions uh, Europeans have about the same issue. Uh, although it does not have um, even remotely the same scope uh, in terms of numbers, but the debates are along the same lines. Now, um, I have been trying to encourage um, my Lebanese interlocutors to um, devise a roadmap or to actually, instead of uh, continuously describing the enormity of the problems, just to um, um, suggest what they would like to see happening and where we can then um, uh, start thinking or having a dialogue which kind of measures which are proposed by the Lebanese we would like to support. Some measures will not find our liking. We would be then telling them, uh, no, this is not what we believe uh, should be done. And other measures we will actively oppose. But the gist of the conversation uh, for the time being in Lebanon is that the European Union and its member states want to keep the Syrian refugees mm -hmm. in Lebanon. Nothing is more wrong than that. We never said that the Syrian refugees need to stay in Lebanon. Um, uh, if Lebanese tell us um, the Syrian refugees need to go home, you know, we would perfectly subscribe to that, to that uh, vision that they need to go home. The only difference we are having, and this is a difference in practical terms, it's not a, a kind of policy debate, um, is whether the, um, uh, the uh, situation in Syria is such that you can organize large-scale returns. Now, this is something, again, this debate we have in Europe as well. There is not a single European member state who deports Syrians to Syria. And these are decisions which are taken in Europe in courts. So what we tell the Lebanese is that we believe that the uh, situation in Syria is not conducive to returns. Now, the Lebanese have taken an initiative together with uh, other Arab countries to discuss returns with, um, uh, with uh, the Syrian uh, regime, and we will see where this discussion goes. Three years ago, the corruption in Lebanon led to the explosion of the port and to destroying uh, the capital of Lebanon to destroy Beirut and to destroy as well the soul of each and every one. 
How do you reflect on what happened? The Uh, the, the blast is a very, very disturbing um, uh, incident because, um, uh, first of all, of the way how um, the immediate, um, uh, the immediate uh, measures which were taken um, were um, showing the weakness of the Lebanese, uh, of the Lebanese system. To, um, to handle uh, a situation uh, of crisis. Um, uh, also, the international community was not prepared uh, for, uh, for this. Um, what It was not helpful as well. Uh, I wouldn't say that, no. What worked very well is the first wave of humanitarian assistance because the humanitarians are, are basically, um, uh, they have a very good system and very good toolbox Uh, to respond to that. So I remember we brought in ambulances from Europe, uh, we brought in a lot of material, uh, blankets. So the, the immediate kind of um, relief. Uh, relief and, and uh, psychosocial support, and, and there are specialized agencies who know to do that. that. Yes, but when I mentioned the word not helpful, I meant not helpful in the investigation. This um, uh, is, the, is the second chapter. This is about um, the accountability and finding out uh, what happened. And, uh, so, but I was talking about just reacting and trying to mitigate the effects of it. Um, in the first phase, it worked very well. In the second phase, we tried to organize ourselves with the World Bank and the United Nations. And I think we delivered um, uh, some, some things, um, rehabilitation of houses and so on, which went beyond the, the immediate relief. But it, uh, the scale of it was not too big because, again, we faced this discussion with the Lebanese, what do we need to do before we start investing in this country? There needs to be more accountable procedures, more transparency. We need to know where we're putting our, our money. And these were very dis difficult discussions, and they still go on. Now, the shocking part um, of, of the Beirut blast is that three years after, after this um, horrible incident, Um, there is basically no transparency, no accountability. There is no um, uh, procedure to try to find out what exactly happened. This is I, think, I think the Lebanese are facing so many upheavals and, and, and so many obstacles on a daily basis that they are really lost. And to fight the right fight, you know, you need to have the proper assets for that. And they do not have mm -hmm. that. Uh, Ralph Taraf, you have come to Lebanon at its worst years since its existence, you know, from a financial crisis and meltdown from the robbery of the century, where all our savings were robbed, from the Beirut blast, the explosion of the century, and of course, a pandemic that has hit the whole world. Do uh, you think that now, at the end of your post, you can say that you did your best and you were able to bring on the table some solutions to those never-ending problems that this country, which you loved, where you've lived in your childhood, uh, uh, has encountered. Uh, what's your say about that? Well, I can definitely assure you that I did my best. <laughs> I couldn't have done better from my personal perspective. Did I deliver? I don't know. I have my doubts. But we were, me together with my colleagues, Um, working here through these years, part of uh, a group um, who tried to see uh, what good can come out of, of, this, of this crisis. And um, the good which can come out of this crisis is that you actually look at your system and ask yourself what needs to be improved. And we are leaving behind um, a number of very valid prescriptions of how you can do things better. It's not just that you say you have to modernize your system, but in a very prescriptive way, we said how you can improve things. Um, there is a public procurement law today in place which was not there um, when I arrived. There is a law on the independence of the judiciary which was not there when, when I arrived. There is an IMF program which is there on the table which was not there when I arrived. We were working a lot on, on these issues while we were here. Now, this is not for us to impose these things. This is for the Lebanese decision makers to pick that up and to say these are ways we would like to adopt and you don't need to adopt them 100%. You can take the parts which you find relevant. But I believe that we have been extremely helpful in, in trying to identify things which can be done better. And if that, uh, these four years of, as you call them, 
um, very, very big shock to, to the Lebanese um, can lead to a better future than it was worth it. Uh, uh, Ralph, what is the image that you will always remember when you think about uh, Lebanon from those last few years? An image that has touched you a lot, an image that has impacted you, and each time you recall it, you are tearful. You know, for me, what was most important in this country was the connection to its people, to the people I had the, 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 the pleasure and the honor to meet. Um, uh, I really believe that um, these human connections, which are very strong in Lebanon, um, are what makes this country very, very unique. Um, uh, I don't know, I feel that this is not just for me, but also for others. Um, uh, the Lebanese are a people who are very easy to connect with. They are very, um, uh, they're very talkative, they're very warm-hearted, they're very extremely excessively generous. Um, and generous not just in material terms, but in terms of their time, their attention, um, their focus. Um, whenever you have an issue, you have uh, Lebanese friends calling, asking about you. How are you doing? How are things? Uh, are, you, are you better or not? Um, this is something which is uh, very, very valuable and which exis exists despite all the hardships and despite all the, the tensions which also exist in the society. The tensions are huge and I hope that we find ways of, of addressing these tensions. You'll be coming back very often, I'm sure of that, but in your different suitcases you're carrying many things. What is the most precious item or thing or memory be taking with you? My friends in Lebanon. One last question. Yes or no? Do you see the change coming? Yes. Thank you.